Thank you so much for tuning in this week on the School of Public Health uh, from the University of Maryland. My name is Kelly Sherman. I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm a student at the School of Public Health. Um, I'm doing pretty well on this Wednesday, which is pretty exciting. But this week we have some special guests. Uh, as always, we have Dean Lushniak um, coming to talk with all of us about COVID-19. And also we have Viraj Shah. So if you both could just give a brief like overview and introduction, that would be amazing. Great, Viraj, why don't you start since you're so much more important than I am. And uh, <laughs> the, students, the students' perspective is very important. So we're, we're glad to have you on today, Viraj. Go on. Um, thank you so much. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, so I'm Viraj Shah. I'm a junior at University of Maryland. Um, I studied neurobiology and health policy. And I'm so happy to be here today because I have the opportunity to provide a little bit about the student angle um, during COVID-19 and also talk about some cool projects I've had the opportunity to work on, such as Chat Health and Public Health Club Borders. Great. Thanks, Viraj. My name is Boris Lushniak. I go with he, his pronouns. And uh, I'm the dean of the School of Public Health at University of Maryland and uh, a public health practitioner. So spent, uh, I counted it yesterday. Yesterday, uh, so it's been about 36 years since I got my master's in public health. So it's been a long, fruitful, and exciting career in public health, one that has had many obstacles and crises in its pathway, and COVID-19 is a crisis. And so it's interesting for me, both from a dean's perspective, from now being an academic center like the University of Maryland College Park, but also for my past experiences to be part of this online chat. So uh, thanks a lot for organizing this uh, to uh, everyone who's behind the scenes here today and back to you, Kelly. Yeah, thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to us. I know this is a, a really stressful topic to talk about, but it's really great to have student perspectives and voices that we've never had on this before. So that's exciting. And also just, just having the professional insight so thank you everyone for who watched last week's session and hopefully they found the Facebook Live like very helpful. This week we're gonna dive into like more of the student perspective like Viraj was saying and also just talking about like telehealth and just how that can help us in our future. Um, before we dive into that, I think there are like just some things that we could just catch up everyone if they were living under a rock for the past week, like what's happening now with the coronavirus. Um, so Dean Lushniak, would you feel comfortable talking about like any new like findings or things that people have been saying? This sure, week? let's sort of, sort of back up. Uh, the United States remains the epicenter of this uh, worldwide pandemic. And so the numbers in the United States are surging. And, you know, and it is that scary week that we knew was going to happen. Uh, so the curve seems to still be going up. Uh, the good news is that there seems to be, you know, we talked in the past about this infamous flattening of the curve. And so the question is, are we really into beginning that flattening stage? Now, first of all, I want our listeners and our viewers out there not to think that it's over by any means. But there is some, you know, some good signs or are some good signs from New York City, where, which obviously has been the epicenter within the epicenter. So if you look at what's going on in New York City, the number of people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, the number of people who have been hospitalized, and certainly the number of, of deaths. And, and you know, we, we share our sympathies with anyone out there right now who has had someone who's been sick in the family or they themselves have been sick. And, and certainly if anybody has, has been through the tragedy of, of death uh, associated with COVID-19, our hearts go out to you. Uh, but right now we're, we're beginning to sort of look at this a little bit more optimistically. Now, the United States is a huge country, which means New York Center is not just, you know, the center of all activity. So what we're seeing in New York, uh, you know, the unknown is what's going to happen in other areas, other regions, other states and cities in the United States. We know Chicago has been hit rather hard. Detroit has been rather hard. Um, uh, as, uh, parts of Florida have been, have been hit hard uh, and, and many other urban areas that are still sort of waiting what's going to be happening. So the numbers still look kind of bad and they continue to go up. But again, a slight flattening in the New York City scene in terms of hospitalizations. When we look at it from a medical perspective, obviously the most severe aspect of this is what is people who need to be put on ventilators. The number of people, patients people who have had to be intubated has, has been flattening down, which means that the severe cases are lessening to a large extent. 
What does that mean for the rest of us? That means that if these numbers in fact are true and we see a pattern of this flattening going on in New York City and in other areas of the United States, that means we're doing the right thing. That from a public health perspective, we've been emphasizing the idea of physical distancing, right? We're now all on Zoom, we're separated. You're not in the classroom, you're not in your dorms. Uh, and, and that's a good thing when it comes to the, uh, the infectious disease uh, of, of COVID-19. Uh, we also have changed our philosophies a little bit in this past week. And all of a sudden, the use of masks on a personal level has certainly increased. Some jurisdictions have, in fact, mandated it. Here, where I live in Rockville, Maryland, Montgomery County now said, as of yesterday, if I go into a grocery store, I'm supposed to be wearing a mask. Uh, my family and I have started that last week, although we're minimizing our leaving the house. Uh, and, and so when, you know, when usually we send our two daughters out to do the shopping, they're wearing masks, they're wearing gloves, and they're maintaining that social distancing, which is, which is, is a key component of all this. There's also been some insights in terms of therapy of COVID-19. A big article that came out just a few days ago in the New England Journal of Medicine that deals with a specific medicine called remdesivir. Remdesivir was initially developed, uh, believe it or not, for potential treatment of Ebola virus. Didn't do that well against Ebola virus, but in the laboratory setting, in animal studies showed that they had had some uh, viability, or actually not in animal studies, but it does in test tube studies, some viability in terms of uh, acting as an antiviral against uh, the COVID-19 disease virus. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. So New England Journal recently published, it's a small study, uh, but it shows at least some positive effect. It's not great. So the panacea, the idea that we have a single therapy that's gonna be work still hasn't been found. Uh, certainly no real big updates recently on the vaccine front, although there's lots of uh, products or, or lots of potential vaccine candidates worldwide that are being looked at. So we've had at least some, you know, kind of more optimistic news this week. But I stress to you, people are still dying, people are still suffering, and the disease is still spreading. So it's not time for us to say, okay, it's over, let's stop what we're doing. Back to you, Kelly. That definitely makes sense. And that's really cool to hear about like all those different research um, studies that are being done. And just, it's very optimistic. Um, Viraj, do you have any, like, how are you feeling like within all of this, like in the past like week or like couple weeks? Yeah, um, you know, it, from a student perspective, it's definitely a huge change. Just thinking that like a little over a month ago, I was at University of Maryland in the School of Public Health, sitting in classrooms um, right before spring break, and just to look at how much life has changed for everyone, um, but how much life has changed for students. Um, something that I've had a really incredible opportunity to do is to continue an internship I had at the Department of Health and Human Services. And what has been really exciting is almost having like, quote unquote, a bird's eye view of how the federal government is responding. And, you know, a lot of the things that um, Dr. Lushniak was saying about, you know, a public health response and making sure that every single person knows that, you know, there are certain steps that they can take to protect themselves and their family, but also, you know, new scientific evidence that's coming. So, you know, life is changing. Moving to online classes is definitely something that we all have to get used to. But, you know, so far staying resilient. That is a really great outlook to have. That is a really cool like perspective that you have too, having your internship, like being able to like coordinate with the Department of Health. Where's your internship again? So it's a, <clears throat> it's the Office of the Surgeon General um, awesome. in the Department of Health and Human Services. That is so cool. That is a really great inlook to see like the federal government and everything. And then I was just wondering if like both of you have seen like what other students are doing like on campus, not on campus, but virtually on campus now to make a difference like within our campus community. Do you wanna, do you wanna start Dr. Lushnack or did you? Sure, why don't you start Faraj? Okay, so you know, I'm, I'm seeing that students are doing all kinds of activist opportunities to be able to do things like just two of my buddies the last week created a free online tutoring platform. So they are getting a bunch of University of Maryland students together and offering free online tutoring for 
you know, students whose educational opportunities were adversely affected by COVID-19. They're also um, working in the context that they did before and staying resilient in their clubs and in their organizations um, and still being able to maximize social impact um, that they had before on campus. So, you know, students um, during this time, I think, you know, while they're definitely having some challenges in online classes, they're staying extremely resilient and kind of staying true to, you know, what they're passionate about, given these like widespread changes that are happening. And what I've seen from my perspective is, is sort of just the volunteerism and the potential of that volunteerism within our students. Last week on, on this online chat, we talked a little bit about the Medical Reserve Corps within the state of Maryland. Uh, we've been monitoring, I don't have the numbers in this last week, but we've been monitoring in, in terms of, you know, trying to get people to notify us at the School of Public Health if, if in fact they've, they've signed up for this Medical Reserve Corps. And I'm encouraging all students to, to do this. Uh, you know, the, uh, the idea of volunteerism, uh, whether it's within the state of Maryland or it's within your own states, wherever you happen to be habitating right now, is a key feature. And almost every state has some aspect of volunteerism. Now, first and foremost, as dean, I got to tell you, your job right now is to be a student. So everybody wants to, to help out and everybody wants to be torn. But right now, you're most beneficial to University of Maryland to the School of Public Health to make sure you're doing well in your studies, that you're concentrating on their, those studies, and that you're readjusting to a major change in perhaps the way you study, right? So that's first and foremost, right? So don't feel this obligation like, oh my God, everybody's volunteering, everybody's doing this, I need to do that. If it fits, start signing up for things, right? But even going through, for example, with the Maryland Medical Reserve Corps, it, it's a simple sign up. It, you know, it doesn't expect you having any medical knowledge or medical background, uh, you know, uh, but you actually do have an online training that you go through and you learn about things such as the incident command system. You learn about how things occur out there, out there in the field. And so those of you looking to expand your horizons by signing up for the Medical Reserve Corps, uh, it opens up a door for sort of sideline educational uh, opportunities, right? And again, not everybody is getting called. I've signed up in the last couple of weeks, and, and I was just informed that, okay, we have your name, uh, and we'll let you know if we need you. So it's, it's really a no obligation. Nobody's going to be forced to do stuff like that. But I'm really encouraging our students, again, if nothing else, to, to, to kind of look through some of the online modules to learn about what's going on. Uh, faculty and staff as well from the School of Public Health are intimately involved in the Medical Reserve Corps. Uh, and there's many other things that we're doing. You know, we've incorporated some of our students from a distance to be working with some of the technical assistance we're providing to, uh, to the state and local health departments uh, in Maryland. Uh, we're working on everything from modeling to looking at surge capacity, to looking at the needs of the state and locals. So there's a lot of activities going on. And um, again, very impressed with our student body, with our faculty and staff in terms of under very stressful times, getting you know, out there and willing to help. Mm -hmm. And then for like out of state students, like myself, I, sorry, have to ask these questions, but um, are like opportunities like the Maryland Medical Reserve Corps like available through other like state departments and stuff? Like where could I go to find information about this? I would simply Google Medical yeah. Reserve Corps and your state. You know, most states have, you know, and these MRC units have been around for a long time. So this is, isn't just something that was set up in, because of COVID-19. This in fact was to a large extent of people's activism in the post 9-11 era and the post anthrax era and to a large extent in the post Hurricane Katrina era, where we realized a key facet of our community are us, right? So in the midst of a community emergency, it's the idea of who's willing to help, who's out there to help, and, and who is, is ready right, to help. And so the Medical Reserve Corps actually used to be a key component within the Office of the Surgeon General, where I used to work and where, where Varash is now uh, doing his internship. Uh, and so it was sponsored by the highest government levels. Uh, now it's within the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response within that realm. Uh, but again, these units are out there. And even if you sign up now and aren't called or aren't able to respond right now, just being signed up allows you to stay active and everything from helping out during times of emergency or getting health education, blood pressure screening, things like that for the good community is a way for us to be able to serve that community. So almost every state, every municipality tends to have what are called MRC units, Medical Reserve Corps units. 
That's awesome. Okay, that's really good to know. I know what I'm doing at one, <laughs> Googling that. But that is really cool. And I think that's really cool to get involved in something. Like I know as a student, I am very stressed out with like all of my classes online and everything. But I do like still having like my clubs that I'm involved with and like different things to like take my mind off of everything and just still have like that routine down. Um, Viraj, I know you're an active member, actually the president of Public Health Without Borders. So like, how are you guys functioning with like this change? And then also, could you just give like a brief overview of what Public Health Without Borders is for those who might not know? Yeah, um, thank you so much for the question. So Public Health Without Borders is a student-led group on the University of Maryland. And our broad goal is to serve as promoters of healthy communities around the world. So we've been around since early 2014, and currently we work in four partner communities. We work in India, Peru, Sierra Leone, and we have a local project in Langley Park. So, you know, after saying that, one of the first things I can note that our club has completely, you know, been changed is that we can't travel. You know, and in the beginning of March, this was something that was a blow to many of our students because like, for example, our India project, they've been preparing for a year and a half for this intervention that first was supposed to happen in January, but there were protests in our partner community that prevented us from going. So they were supposed to go in spring break. But even that was canceled. Now our summer teams can't travel. So, you know, when that happened, we all came together as an organization and said, you know, what can we do to still be able to stay true to our mission you know, continuously engage our members, um, but do so in a way that's socially distant, you know, practicing guidelines for social distancing um, and allowing our members to stay healthy. So just about a week and a half ago, we had our first virtual GBM, so general body meeting, where we had a partnership with the Academy for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and we did a design thinking workshop on oral health. Um, all of our project teams are still meeting every single week, which I'm super excited about. And our executive board meeting is, me is meeting like every other week. Um, we're working on development that's potentially, you know, registering as a nonprofit, figuring out naming and branding. We're developing toolkits. So for example, just last week, we finished a toolkit on hand washing, where we took six, six years of student experiences internationally doing hand washing education and comprise it into this excellent toolkit that we can then give to other passionate undergrads around the country. So understanding that yes, we're all students and yes, our life has really changed, but that doesn't mean that we can't stay true to what our, the core of our organization, right? And you know, what we believe in and stay as activists of global public health. That is so cool to see that you guys are so like, also virtually meeting for GBMs, that was <laughs> chaotic. <laughs> it was chaotic. Yeah. <laughs> so great that you guys are still passionate and like getting together to do this. And I've seen so many of your posts or like through the School of Public Health about like the importance of washing your hands and everything. And I feel like they've definitely been boosted during this time now. So that's really awesome that you guys are still working on like creating those toolkits and spreading the message to like the different partner communities. Um, I was just curious, do you have any connections like with the partner communities and do you know like how they're doing during this time? Yeah, they are all, you know, to different degrees adversely affected. So each one of our partner communities is in a complete lockdown scenario. So I can, you know, I can first speak about India as India is in a federal lockdown state home order. In fact, a lot of my family members in India, you know, are being adversely affected by this. Um, but, you know, no one in India really can leave their house. And in fact, there are policemen on the streets that are only letting people come out for several hours and are, you know, very closely restricting it just so they can get essential food. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, it becomes hard for us to really do anything. You know, one of the first things that we thought about was being able to do our interventions virtually. But then you go to a community where outside of school, a lot of these families don't have access to reliable internet, don't have access to reliable technology, so it becomes really hard. So we see a similar narrative in Sierra Leone, where their healthcare system is already being stressed to the end because they have just a few cases of coronavirus and they're still recovering from, you know, the aftermath of the Ebola. Um, and, you know, you see a similar narrative in Peru. So from an organization perspective, what we're trying to do is stay in contact with our partner communities. I know all three of our teams in the last two weeks has been on the phone um, with the representatives of our partner communities. And, you know, from my perspective, it's being there for our partner communities in any way we can help. Our Sierra Leone team is currently um, making a coronavirus handbook fact sheet 
for the children in our partner community to give to them. And our teams in Peru and India are about to start doing similar things. So it's understanding that we can talk to members in our partner community, those that have access to phone and internet, but you know, it's understanding how we can still make a part of an impact or do anything that can give them access to important information that can potentially, you know, improve how they on a personal level and on a community level can respond to this. That's so awesome. Um, Dean Lushniak, do you, are you aware of any um, faculty members in the School of Public Health who are still like very hands-on with Public Health Without Borders during this time? Well, Dr. Meering, yeah, <laughs> Dr. Meering is, is, is the lead uh, and uh, working with Dr. Borzakowski as well. Uh, so our whole Global Health Initiative uh, group and, and there's many other faculty members who are uh, very closely aligned with, with, with this group. Uh, you know, the beauty of this group is it's the first and only of its kind in the United States, right, in terms of having this group, Public Health Without Borders, obviously kind of working under the premise of another group called Engineers Without Borders. That's a, a very official uh, transnational organization. Uh, also, obviously, you know, mimicking to some extent some of the work of Doctors Without Borders, Medicine Sans Frontier that uh, is out there always doing great things. And so I'm very proud of the fact that the University of Maryland School of Public Health has this group, that it is a student-run organization, the leadership of the whole executive committee, uh, you know, with, which Faraj, you know, works with very closely as the president for this year. Uh, and the fact that they really bring to light two things, right? The first thing is that activities can still continue in the midst of COVID-19, even though we're all separated, even though we're in our homes or you know, outside of the university environment, right? We can still bring good to the world. And I was just as heartbroken as anybody, right? That the India team did not get to go to India. Uh, and who knows when the doors will be open, but that doesn't stop their work. It's not like our students turned around and said, okay, can't do it, it's not done, so therefore it's not a priority. It still remains a priority. And the other thing that it focuses on is sometimes we become very self-centric in the midst of crisis, right? We look at what's going on in our community, we sit there and woe be us, this is terrible. But I just wanna remind you, this is a pandemic. Pan denotes the fact that it's all over the world. And if you've not done this already, right, Google very quickly. Johns Hopkins University and COVID-19 data or COVID-19 dashboard. And it'll immediately get you to what, you know, our friends at, at Hopkins at the School of Public Health and within the university are doing. And it'll give you a dashboard that shows you the red dots all over the planet. And if you look at the left side of that dashboard, it'll give you a listing of, you know, which nations are involved. And as of yesterday, it was 185 nations. Involved. It's probably up this, this, on, on this day. It's been constantly going up. And so the reality is, is what we're going through as a community is now multiplied by every single community on this planet. And whether they've had the COVID-19 come through already, whether they're expecting it to come through, or whether in, they're in the midst of a bad crisis right now, they need our compassion, our understanding, and yes, even from a distance, our help. So what a great opportunity for us to, to show our do good philosophy at the University of Maryland. Very proud of public health. Thank you. That's so true. And I, um, I've i used the Johns Hopkins website before and I think that's like really fascinating and a really cool tool. Also on the website, it shows how many people have recovered too, which I think is a really great number to report and talk about, especially when you always see like scary numbers within the media. but. Talking, that's actually a cool transition, but talking about the media, have you guys been listening to like any podcasts or any other videos or resources that you thought were very informative and uplifting during this time? I feel like media oftentimes can be very overwhelming, at least if it's constantly in your face. And I was just wondering if you guys had any good recommendations for people at the School of Public Health. Um. One thing that I like to read every morning, um, it's positive sometimes. It tends to be like a little more fact-driven, but it really does a great job of summarizing, you know, weekly and even on a daily basis, impact of COVID-19 on a lot of different populations in the United States, whether it be like um, just community members, healthcare professionals, um, you know, people whose work life has been affected by it. It's the Washington um, Post Health 202, 
by um, Paige Cunningham, I think it does a really, really good job of just explaining what's going on every single day um, in the midst of COVID-19. So I like to read that in the morning. That's awesome. And for me, you know, it's one of those things that there's so many educational opportunities right now, right? I, I mean, every day I get informed from the American Public Health Association, right, about multiple podcasts that are going on, the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. And, and those of you who are listening out there, you know, write down APHA, write down ASPPH, so that's the American Public Health Association, the American uh, School uh, Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, ASPPH, the National Academies of Science, or the National Academy of Medicine, NAM, uh, and if you look at these, uh, the, their websites, there's always podcasts coming up. And, and, and the reality is that the ones I'm looking at mostly now are a slightly different angle, right? I've been a little bit, to be honest, inundated with the idea of the numbers and the effect on this, right? I can get that from the Hopkins site, and, and I don't need to be reminded necessarily of that. Um, you know, the whole issue of, of some of the up and coming research, I think is interesting. I'm always looking for a slightly different angle, which is teach me something new or let me view this COVID-19 from a different perspective. And I'm not sure how our viewers are looking at this. I always warn people that we don't wanna be oversaturated with the same information all the time. So look at these podcasts as saying, okay, is there a different perspective? You know, last week we had Dr. Thomas on from the Maryland Center for Health Equity, and, and we were talking about the idea of health disparities and how the African American communities and communities of color are, you know, are, are affected to a larger extent both by morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. That's something that we should all look at as being kind of a, a tragic but unique feature. And the reality is, how do we look at that from a slightly different angle? That's an example of, of where I've been going in these past few weeks. Because you can spend 24-7 looking at everybody, every brand new podcast out there. But do something that develops a different part of your brain in the midst of this COVID-19. Uh, so, you know, again, a lot of information out there. But don't be afraid to walk away from over information overload. I can't emphasize enough. Your job right now to our students is to be a student study, take your breaks, mm -hmm. do physical activities as much as you, as you can. You know, I still walk every day and, and, you know, do it separated from my family members, but we take that infamous walk into the woods, right? And we enjoy nature and, you know, we're following the rules, obviously, but it allows us to get some exercise and to do stuff out there. The idea of reading a good book, of, you know, just kicking back, listening to music, an important part of this. So uh, in the midst of a crisis, don't get overloaded with one specific activity. Take that break. Definitely. I have been walking my dog probably every single day, and that is the highlight of my day and my dog's day, which is great. <laughs> but Viraj, how have you been like keeping in touch with like your A, having fun during this time, and then also like as a student, how have you been prioritizing your schoolwork and like setting aside times to study. I know it's so hard like if your family's eating dinner or like whatever the case may be, like how are you setting those boundaries for yourself? Yeah, and I think a lot of what um, Dean Lushniak said applies to me is that it's understanding that yes, my role of as a student comes first and I need to make sure that I stay focused on that, but also like listening to music, exercising every single day, I go and I live right outside Annapolis, Maryland, close to the water. So I go and I go at an off time where there aren't many people outside and I take this like mile long walk to the pier. Um, and I get to see like in the distance, the Naval Academy. And it's really refreshing because it's an opportunity where I can just go outside and enjoy nature every single day. And it like is honestly the highlight of every single day. And I love it. Um, so other than that, it's honestly just being able to you know, try to do things that I like, but also things that I'm interested in, you know, mm -hmm. schools will always be there. And, you know, some class situations for me are definitely more difficult than others, because it's, you know, for me, some of the hard, like basic science, like chemistry classes are more harder to convert to an online scenario. So that's definitely been a little bit of a challenge. But I think one of the things that has been absolutely fantastic is a lot of friends and a lot of colleagues at the University of Maryland are all going through the exact same thing. So hopping on the phone with friends every single day, going on Zoom chats, being able to just like meet with public health without borders, um, the chat health people every day, continuing to work on the things that I love working on, 
but just being in contact with people. I think that is something that's definitely helped keep me afloat. That's awesome. You just mentioned chat health. I'm pretty sure not everyone who's listening to this call knows what chat health is. So I was wondering if you could talk what is chat health and just give like a basic overview of that. Sure. Um, so chat health is a not for profit organization that I co founded about I think a year ago at this point. So the premise of it is that um, there are gaps right now in health literacy and technology has a really important role and incredible potential to be able to accelerate and improve um, the information that people can get about health crises and especially with regards to COVID-19, how people can practice proper prevention, but also how they can practice mindfulness, how they can stay healthy, how they can stay happy, you know, positive psychology. So what chat health is, is it's a web platform that houses two artificial intelligence chatbots. So these are things where you can go and text responses um, to our chatbot and get um, you know real time responses back, um, and then also look at our website for information about COVID nineteen, um, Twitter updates, myth busting, and fact checking. So our essential goal is public health students. This is all run by UMD students every single week, um, and this incredible group of public health volunteers, which Kelly is a part of, um, that we have a role, and there is a incredible potential for us to use novel and cutting edge artificial intelligence technology to be able to improve and help people get crucial information about COVID-19 that can help guide their behaviors and prevention measures. So it's this line that I always go back to that Dr. Lushniak said, I think sometimes like a year ago, he said that you can learn things in public health in the classroom, but public health really happens. Where you can take what you learn in the classroom and translate it on the field. And I think, you know, chat health was, is a cool example of a continuing effort where we're able to do that. That is really awesome that you have that opportunity to do that. So how can we know like that the information is being accurate that people are receiving when you're texting this chatbot? Mm -hmm. So like I was saying, chat health is two chatbots. So on our web platform is a Telegram chatbot and it works through the Telegram app, which is kind of like WhatsApp, but it's just run by Google. So the Telegram chatbot is a more option-based chatbot. So it's something where you can go in download the app, and it is an interaction essentially through options and buttons. So based on you clicking a button, it gives you a bunch of options. So it is really focused on a user experience where you can get a lot of different information points around coronavirus. Um, like you were saying though, we have a second bot, which is an SMS bot, which is where you text a number, um, and then it goes to a backend server that we have students monitoring pretty much all day long. So we have this incredible group of public health students, all undergraduates at the University of Maryland, that are constantly going in and checking questions that come from users, going to information banks that we have prepared and using peer reviewed journals, using Hopkins and Maryland websites, government resources such as the CDC, to then provide fact checked and verified responses to user inquiries in real time. That's awesome. Are you guys still looking for more volunteers? So right now, we are still looking for some volunteers because we've seen a slight spike in usage, which we're really, really happy about. But, you know, something that we're working on is continuously improving the SMS user experience. So mm -hmm. building more infrastructure for our volunteers to put in links to info pages like the CDC, the World Health Organization, university resources, so that users can have a really tailored response that they can get from our chat health system, where they not only get targeted information that our volunteers would provide, but secondarily a link where they can explore themselves and get more information. So continuously understanding that we can update this technology to further improve how community members and students alike can use our resource. That is so cool. I, that, yeah, that is really cool. I have had the privilege to volunteer on Chat Health and I love it. I've answered several questions and I always make sure to link whatever CDC thing I get my research from just to make sure that people can read more if they want, but also I have the too long don't read text link available for them. But uh, Dean Lushniak, would you feel comfortable talking about like how health technology like chat health and everything has changed the game for epidemiologists and other health professionals while like tracking COVID-19? 
You know, it, it's sort of, it's fascinating that we are in a changed world compared to what we were even a decade ago. Um, you know, and I'll put in this sort of the bigger perspective, as I mentioned, I think previously on this online chat, which is the last time we had such a major pandemic was 1918, 1919. That was, what was that term, the Spanish flu, incorrectly called the Spanish flu, but it was an H1N1 variant of the influenza virus. And it spread through the world and, and was a major killer. 50 million plus people died worldwide. 675,000 died in the United States. And when we compare ourselves to that era, think of all the changes. I think the changes in terms of technology, connectivity, the idea that, that we have these things around, right, that we didn't have before, that we have watches that give information before. You know, 100 years ago, as I mentioned before, is that when we had that pandemic influenza breaking out worldwide, we didn't even have microscopes that were powerful enough to actually see the virus. We didn't even know it was a virus. It was assumed that it was some sort of bacteria. So let's try, you know, some bacterial type treatments for it. And they tried to make a vaccine out of bacteria that obviously totally failed. So in the 100 years, we've done incredible changes. But also in the last decade, we've done and I applaud, you know, Raja's ideas that, you know, part by the way, that, you know, was supported by the Gold Award, Bob Gold, who's the founding dean of our School of Public Health. He and his wife, Barbara, uh, put in funding a few years ago to have innovative ideas, not just for School of Public Health students, but our students working with partnerships throughout the university. So stay tuned. We had to reschedule the Gold Awards because of COVID-19, but back in the fall, students, you have ideas of going out there, right? Viraj is an example, and many others are examples of people who have brought these ideas to uh, the Gold Award Committee and who have presented in front of them and gotten those ideas funded. Uh, think deeply now of how we can utilize modern technology. Even five years ago, when I was part of the response of Ebola, uh, of the Ebola epidemic in Liberia, what did we rely on? Even in Liberia, you think of, okay, you know, this is not just an American phenomenon in terms of technology. It's a worldwide phenomenon. A mm. lot of people, if not the majority of the population in Liberia did have phones, cell phones. That was a major form of communication. Well, all of a sudden you're using a cell phone, right, to provide health education information, right? That's an example. Even look at the last 24 hours as we're talking about pulling out of this spin of a pandemic, the key feature is gonna be what? It's gonna be testing, it's gonna be tracking, and it's gonna be treatment, which referred to as the three T's. Google, you know, is, is looking at this whole idea, you know, with, you know, multiple partnerships are, are, are kind of looking out there and, and in essence saying, okay, how can we actually program our phones to help us in tracking? And, and you know, yes, there's privacy issues, but think of the beauty of this phone, right? It can track who I've come in contact with. Well, if I happen to have come in contact with an individual who now tested positive, right? Yes, privacy is an issue, but I can potentially be informed by saying, hey, Boris, guess what? Last week, or six feet, or maybe four feet inadvertently of a person who is now positive. We're informing you. Could you imagine that technology and utilizing it as opposed to asking me, did you come in contact with a person, with some stranger? That did? I don't know. I don't have that data, but these machines have that data. That's an example, I think, of where our world is going and how can we can really utilize right, the partnerships of, of the big companies that are out there who have this information. Always take into account the idea of privacy, right? Is it an infringement on privacy? But in the midst of a crisis, these can be important sources of information. Yeah, if Kelly, if I could just like briefly yeah, add yeah, to that, as I think um, the role in the adoption of technology during the COVID-19 crisis has been incredible. So example, um, Facebook, um, the World Health Organization and a few other huge technology companies just hosted a global hackathon where they had over 1300 novel ideas such as chat health as submissions um, that you can use technology to think for things like allocation of medical supplies, for patient communication tools for doctors who have made come in contact with COVID, for chatbots like Chat Health for community members to get information about COVID-19, 
for us to model supply chains. You know, it's these incredible things that, like Dr. Lushnak was saying, the last time we had a pandemic, very little to none of this technology was here. So it's now understanding that these big companies have been able to leverage their influence and their resources to allow people like us, like students, to be able to come bring these forth these ideas for social good, for public health. And I think, you know, I, as someone who's really interested in public health technology, you know, this is inspiring that we are having not only our faculty at the University of Maryland School of Public Health, um, but advisors and organizations supporting us to push out this technology for social good. That is so true. I didn't know about that hackathon that was happening, but that is amazing that those big companies are coming together during this time. And it just shows like our resilience as a whole, like during this pandemic and how to help each other out during these times. But um, how, Viraj, I have a few questions about like advisors and just like faculty mentors. I was wondering like where you're like, I guess inspiration came for, for health technology. Like personally, I think that before I came to the University of Maryland, I wasn't that aware of different health technology outlets and stuff. And now just within classroom settings, I've learned a lot more about health tech. I was just wondering if you could talk about your experience, like learning about health tech at UMD. Yeah, so I will share a very similar experience that before I came to University of Maryland, I knew that technology could be used for patient outcomes and can be used in clinical settings and in hospitals but I had no clue that there was this entire world of that exact same technology can be leveraged for public health. So mm -hmm. it was through two experiences during my sophomore year that I can like really pinpoint it. So one is I had an opportunity to work with Dr. George Askew, who is the deputy chief, the deputy administrator of health, human services and education, really long title at Prince George's County. Um, and then also take a course with a school public health faculty member called HELSA 300 with Dr. Neil Siegel, who is faculty in health policy and management. So these two experiences, being able to see the policy side of health and health technology, and then the actual translational impact of, hey, this technology exists and you can translate it to public health benefit. Seeing these two things in parallel showed me that you don't have to be a computer science major. You don't have to be a techie, quote unquote, to be able to have an idea and utilize technology for public health benefits. So that's kind of where I got interested, but it was 100% being a student at the University of Maryland and taking you know, use of incredible resources within the School of Public Health, winning the gold award and having the School of Public Health say, hey, we have these resources here for you as a student to help accelerate these public um, health ideas for technology. Um, and you know, just having this entire supportive community of students as well at the University of Maryland to push forward my interest in this idea. That's really amazing that you have that community here at UMD to help you grow. And I'm proud to be a part of it too. Um, not really influencing your <laughs> perspective on health technology, but I do appreciate it a lot. Um, Dean Lushniak, I have another question just about telehealth in general. Um, what do you think like the future of telehealth will look like post pandemic? Well, we're certainly learning a whole lot in terms of how we can modify the practice of medicine. And here at telehealth, I'll, I'll be very distinct, right? This is the care of an individual between a healthcare provider and that individual. Um, and, and there's mixed feelings about this. I have a friend of mine who's a family physician in, in Virginia who, who is worried that now that he's doing telehealth, that in essence, that this will become the norm. And the reason he, he's a little afraid is that it, it changes the texture of that personal connectivity between a healthcare provider, in his case, a family physician and that patient. And he hopes that that doesn't become the default, right? That in essence, looking a person in the eye, having them present with you is part of the reason that you can actually pick up on things, right? You can look at a demeanor of a person and say, listen, you know, you seem to be, you know, sad. Can you, let's talk about it, right? Now it's, and things that may not be reflected over the, the internet, over the Zoom uh, uh, appointment scenario. So there is a negative. It's not a panacea saying that this is where we should go. But certainly we've learned a whole lot that in terms of efficiencies, in terms of potentially even cost savings, in terms of even access, 
right? Yes, there's access to the internet and high speed connectivity, but the idea is this really does change the texture that I don't need to get into my car or get on public transportation to go see my doctor. That maybe there are certain things that will be more efficiently handled this way. And that ultimately it will be a benefit to both the patient as well as the healthcare provider. Um, Certain specialty arenas, obviously, this doesn't apply to. My next door neighbor is a dentist. I was just talking with her yesterday. Maintaining six feet distance in the driveway uh, of uh, her practice is completely changed, right? She can only do a certain amount of triage when somebody says, my tooth really hurts. But when it comes to actually looking, right, and, and saying, okay, here's the problem, you know, uh, again, maybe modifications of having special, you know, uh, cameras that one can sort of say, here's my tooth, can you have a look at it, what do you think? But if it comes to ultimately treating that tooth, that can't be done. And that's sort of the disclaimer when it comes to telemedicine, that it will work in certain circumstances. I see it as a potential, for example, we have a major problem in this country of rural health, right? The idea that physicians have left the rural communities, hospitals have closed down in the rural communities. And that's one aspect of, of telemedicine that can be done. Uh, you know, one of my training areas is in dermatology. Well, teledermatology is a popular area because in essence, a lot of what we do in dermatology is look at people's skin and say, okay, here's what I think you have. Yes, there's the history, yes, there's a physical exam, but a lot of it is observation. So that's an example of a specialty arena that actually, you know, works very well in the telemedicine world. But I think what we're going to see is as a result of everything we're learning in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of this crisis, it's going to produce changes, and I hope changes for the better. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that insight. And yeah, I didn't think about like specifying it through specialties and seeing which specialties would work, but that is really cool to have that insight. I'm not sure if my dentist could do anything without being two feet above me <laughs> with a right. huge light above mm -hmm. my head. But thank you guys so much for your insight and just your time today to talk about COVID-19 and just different perspectives. Um, Viraj, I'm going to throw you on the spot and do something really fun. So I would love for you to just talk for 30 seconds about how you're feeling and how this impacts your life. And it's like a monologue. Just go for it. <laughs> I think the biggest thing that's changed for me is when I was on campus, each day had a distinct flavor. Like I would do a different thing on every single day. Sure, I'd be doing homework every single day. I'd be studying, I'd be working. But like now it almost feels like every single day is the same. And I can't tell a Monday from a Friday other than on Monday, I have one class and on Friday, I have a different class. So it's definitely gotten a little different and a little weird in that sometimes I kind of lose track of days, which isn't a good thing. But at the same time, it just shows that my life has completely changed. I mean, there are some things that I've actually been a little more efficient at. I have the opportunity to work on things that I didn't have an opportunity to work on as much on campus, but just my daily schedule has changed. But I think one of the best things um, about being able to just be resilient and being able to just stay working forward um, is being able to talk a lot with my friends, but also spending a lot of time with my family. I don't remember the last time I was with my family for this long since I, I don't know. Like it's been a very, very long time since I've been with my family and gotten to spend so much time with my family, which I think is actually an excellent thing because I have a younger brother as well and he's about to go off to college and then I'm gonna be going off to some form of graduate education in another year. So, you know, I think that's definitely been a positive. That's a very wholesome approach. I love that. Dean Lushniak, are you and your family members still playing board games at night? Yep, you know, we're doing that. <laughs> we started looking at a little bit of old family movies, right? Seeing when the kids were little. And again, I have two daughters, 22 and 20, one heading to med school next year, the other a junior at Wash U in St. Louis. And it's interesting, my perspective on this is, is really from the various roles that I play. First of all, as Dean of the School of Public Health, couldn't be prouder, couldn't be prouder of our students. I kind of know what you're going through, right? In terms of both the positives and negatives of teleeducation, because just down the hall from me right now is my junior daughter, right? Who basically says, you know, I sometimes really hate it. I hate hearing the lectures online. I hate taking the quizzes and the tests online. I miss my friends. I miss studying in the library. This has really sort of diverted me a 
whole lot for this semester. I understand what our students are going through. All I can ask you is, you know, persevere through this. None of us ask for this. Do well. Try to figure out ways to deal with this strange circumstance. I'm proud of our faculty and staff, right? The fact that we're working with the state and locals. We're doing modeling for them. We're doing surge capacity for them. Uh, we're out there conducting research on transmission of COVID-19, right? So we're doing incredible things out there. Um, I, I look at the family time that we have, as Farad said, let's look at it as a positive. These are golden times that we'll probably never, ever have again in our lives, knock on wood, right? The fact that we're together, let's make the most of it. Uh, and, and then again, let's all be ready for anything. It, it's kind of interesting. We were talking about the Medical Reserve Corps. I talked a little bit about it. You may have noticed that I was looking at my phone. Why? Because I had a phone call from an 866 number. Right, what does that mean? That means it's probably some scam call or something, you know, why is it coming in? But then I look at the message left behind. Guess what just happened during this time period of this phone call? It's the Medical Reserve Corps saying, we need people to help at testing facilities next week. Are you available? And I pressed a button that said yes, right? And that all unfolded at this time, time period. So the idea of really sort of even saying to ourselves is, well, are we ready? Right? I hesitated for a second because I said, well, that puts me at risk. That means I have to shave my beard to put on the N95s and get it tested. Right? That means that I'm going to have to figure out some way of time management. Next week. But guess what? The call came and we all should be ready. And the answer is, are we ready? Are we ready to serve our society to do what's good? And that inspires me because I've seen that in others. I've seen that in you as students. And that inspires me to say, Press the button one and let's see. So, you know, this is this is all good, Kelly. How about you, Kelly? How do yeah, you, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> back at you? I, <laughs> well, how why would you guys put me after Dean Lucian? Like, like, how do you top that? <laughs> but I have been feeling um, yeah, I'd say very frazzled during this time, just like adjusting to different things that are happening. I'm definitely excited to be home and with my family. Um, we've been kind of experimenting with like different meals every night and like it's it's a lot of fun to just play around in the kitchen and just like having those like connections that I wouldn't have had at college and then also like it's good to know that I have a support system at home and like really taking advantage of that and also just catching up with my friends over zoom or reaching out to people and like seeing different things on social media like I've seen so many posts where people are just being optimistic or sharing a photo from the summer when they were at the beach and just like a happy time. And it's just good to take those like mental vacations every once in a while. And I'm really hopeful that we all be able to do that soon. And it's just like really great to see people who are so optimistic and so selfless like in our lives. But I would thank you guys both again for being so selfless and so helpful for to every single person at the School of Public Health and everyone who's watching this Facebook Live right now, it really means a lot that you guys took an hour out of your day to stay here and talk to me and answer some questions that we had. Um, I hope you all have the best day and best week and rest of your week. And to everyone who's watching the Facebook Live, thank you so much for tuning in. And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments or reach out to the SPH comms email for next week. Thank you guys so much. Great. Thank you. Job well done. See you, guys. Thank you. Stay healthy, everyone.